of you make a circuit board. So what's in here is a, a circuit board that has probably 16 layers or more. And that's how the little conductive pathways that connect different parts of the circuit to each other are, are allowed to pass under and over each other. Because they can't cross, or otherwise you'll have a short. Um, so we're interested in how to, how to do that in textiles. How can you sew something that allows multiple layers to not touch each other? Um, and we've been exploring doing that with just a regular lock stitch machine by changing the tension um, in the two different threads so that one floats on one side and one floats on the other side and then the fabric insulates the two layers from each other. Um, we've also been looking at crimped connectors. So we have a lot of crimped connectors in clothing like studs or snaps. Um, and we also have crimped connectors in electronics, like through hole components that have legs like that that grip around. Um, and they, they can be useful in making connections between layers. Um, this one I'm particularly excited about. This is a new sensor that we've been working on for the last year or so. Um, and you may recognize the stitch. For those of you who haven't sewn knit garments before, you might also be wearing that stitch. Um, it's in your t-shirt hem. It's probably the most common place you'd see it. Um, it's called a cover stitch. And we um, use that, that machine to make a stretch sensor just by sw swapping out one of the yarns in the cover stitch with the conductive yarn suddenly you have something that responds to stretch by changing in resistance. And not only is it a sensor, but it's also a stitch. I mean, it's something that we know works in clothing. We know it's comfortable. Um, we also know how to make it, you know? You don't have to teach a sewing line how to, you know, glue this stiff thing in a fancy way and not sew over the wires. And, you know, this is something we are already doing. So it makes it much easier to manufacture. <laughs> Um, and then the last thing I want to leave you with challenges uh, in disciplinarity. And this is, I think, one of the most important difficulties in wearable technology today. Um, you can laugh at this too because I also made this and it's supposed to be a joke. Um, this is my shirt elator. Doesn't that sound like a great idea? Um, I made the shirt elator because it illustrates a lot of the, um, the problems with clothing meets technology. Um, and that is that the people who make clothing and the people who make technology are not usually the same person. Um, and as such, they have these preconceived notions of the part that they know a lot about and preconceived notions about the part that they don't know a lot about. Um, and the, the inexperience with the part they don't know a lot about means that things don't always cross that divide very well. So the tendency of apparel designers coming to technology is to take what they've seen in the world around them and graft that onto clothing. So I've seen a, a calculator and I know about shirts, so let's make a shirt later, you know? And the, the same goes in reverse as well. Um, people who design technology might know a lot about technology, but they don't know a lot about clothes, so they just take their technology thing and paste it onto the clothes. And that doesn't work. It doesn't, I mean, it, you end up with something like this that is bulky, stiff, uncomfortable, and a really bad idea. Like this is no longer a good calculator, and it's no longer a good shirt. So this is not, sensible. <laughs> but my, my favorite real world example of this is um, MP3 player jackets. Does anybody know anybody who owns an MP3 player jacket? I've asked this question of so many groups and nobody has ever raised their hand. Do you know how many companies make MP3 player jackets? I counted about three or four years ago and there were a hundred companies making MP3 player jackets and nobody buying them. <laughs> so, and that's a perfect example. Like We know about controlling your MP3 player and we know about jackets. So put the two together, and it doesn't work very well. You know? So this is the problem of disciplinarity. And without really knowing something about the technology and something about the clothing, it's really difficult to bridge that gap. You, you essentially need to find the perfect collaborative relationship where you know this and they know that and you work perfectly together. But to me, that's like getting married. Like that's like the hardest thing in the world to find. So the likelihood of that succeeding is much less than the likelihood of you succeeding if you learn something about the other thing, which you have direct control over. Um, so my goal in, at, in our program at U of M is to introduce students to enough technology that they A, understand a little bit about how it goes together, and B, are able to interpret that technology in ways that are appropriate to their discipline. Um, so everybody graduates having built at least one LED circuit. And in terms of technology, like turning on an LED is not a whole lot. But in having to build that in, you start understanding things about electrical connections, about how to integrate conductors, and something about like how that technology is not fixed. It's not just this <coughs> LED that goes on and then it's finished. It's, it's a light source. So it's up to you, the designer, to interpret light 
And we've never had to interpret light and clothing, but we have had to interpret things like graphic, color, silhouette, drape, even, even light in the sense of shiny or not shiny. Like how are we redirecting light? Um, so light is just a, a medium. It's, it, it's just something you can use in design, um, but it's up to you to sort of interpret that. Um, so these are two student projects that just used plain old LEDs um, to achieve something that you know is a little bit more dramatic than what they had achieved without the, the additional responsive effect. Um, and then these are slightly more functionally focused. This one is a glove for air traffic control. So instead of holding sticks in their hand, they have their hands free and then they can be more specific in their messaging by using different parts of their hand. Um, and this one is another part of that solar project I showed you the jacket of. And this is a little dress for a little girl, and it uses the solar energy to power a toy. So she has a little squeeze ball in her pocket, and when she squeezes it, that flower spins around just to entertain her. Okay, so I'll leave you with this question. Um, people always ask me, like, what's clothes going to be like in the future? That's what you do, right? Um, and I will tell you that they look like whatever you want them to look like, and more importantly, they look like what you need them to look like. So I think the more important question is, what do we need from clothes? And that's not just like, keep me warm or keep me modestly covered. That's like, what am I saying about myself? How much versatility do I need in that expression? Um, as well as things like, what could it do you know, if we're not limited to what clothing already does? So I will leave you with that question and a few minutes for questions if you have it. What is that tab thing? An oh, RFID tag, radio frequency identification. It's um, also used in like security tags. Um, uh, inventory control. Yeah, inventory control. It, it, it's a little antenna, and when you pass a reader over it, the reader um, puts a alternating signal through it that causes it to sort of vibrate in response, and it spits back out its number. All it does is shout its number, and then I associate the number with something else. Have any of your designs been commercialized? Good question. No. <laughs> um, so that's, it gets to a much deeper question, I think. Um, so at some point in my career, I had to make a choice, and I never thought that I would be a professor, just for the record. Never thought that I would be a professor. Right enough. Um, but you know, at each sort of stopping point, I looked around and saw what kind of jobs I could get. And I've been working in wearable technology since I was an undergrad. So at each point, it was a question of where can I go? And there was never any industry that was exciting enough to work in. So um, I ended up in academia, and uh, which allows me to pursue all the questions that I want to pursue. Um, but I think that the role of academia in wearable technology is to, to work on those problems that are bigger than the product getting to market. So I focus on things that take longer than a product cycle, like the question of how do you put a sensor in that gets good information out, um, so that hopefully I'm enabling the people who would then be trying to bring products to market to actually do that successfully. And that's sort of what I say. Any patents yet? Um, a few pending. <laughs> Takes a while. <laughs>
And then the PhD is actually in computer science from the University of Dublin. So it's marrying two, uh, two different areas, the arts and technology. And I, I think I would encourage you, I made that jump into technology when I was just about the same age as you are right now, as a senior in, in college. And now's the time to do it. If you're interested in this, it is so, so very feasible to pick up these skills. It may seem like a completely different major, but I guarantee you, if you want to spend two months out of this summer, you could be up to speed and you have skills that will never be uh, harmful. <laughs> they always are helpful in some way. So ask if you want to know.